Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk about Japanese post-war culture. Um, in the sense, kind of to largely present a counterpoint really to a couple of the comments or a couple of the kind of driving threads, I suppose, behind the, la the couple of the last videos. So, for example, we have the era of high-speed growth, which is largely defined, or at least in the West, became defined by this highly kind of... Um, sometimes seen as a prescriptive role for certain leadership positions, whether that be corporate leadership or governmental leadership. Um, and there's some truth to the extent to which to which that was the case. Um, in practice, what you're really having in Japan, and we'll talk about for a few minutes now um, in this video, is this fascinating kind of balance between a certain type of a conservative um, elite that is focused on a specific vision of Japan's role in the world, and then and then other Japanese constituencies. I mean, it's I think it's tempting to think about you know kind of two broad Japanese constituencies, a kind of a conservative you know incremental group and a more liberal progressive group. But you know that's about as true in Japan as it is in the United States. You know, it's 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 true to an extent that there's kind of two types of people, but but that that falls apart fairly quickly once you start getting into people's political views and their cultural attachments and associations and everything else. Politically speaking, um, the Japanese are kind of dominated in many ways, or Japanese politics is dominated by a specific kind of, um, a specific concept, paradigm, if you want to call it that, and particularly the success of the LDP, or the Liberal Democratic Party, which was founded in 1955 and has been the dominant party in Japanese politics with only a, a handful of years as exceptions since that date. Throughout this entire time, the LDP has almost always provided the Prime Minister and the leadership of the government. Does this mean that Japan's not a democracy? Functionally, it does not mean that at all. And there's no question that uh, Japan is an open democracy, that Japan has universal suffrage, and that Japanese votes uh, produce Japanese politicians. If you want to get a bit more complicated about it, um, which is our job, it starts to get tricky. I personally would not feel comfortable saying that Japan isn't a democracy. However, um, in fact, I feel very uncomfortable saying that. I think Japan is clearly a democratic society. At the same time, the LDP has proved itself to be remarkably um, successful at using the system to its benefit. And in particular, for example, uh, leveraging what are effectively rural conservative votes over urban votes when, as we now know by the 1970s, three in four Japanese people live in cities. So, for example, in 1976, the Liberal Democratic Party received only 41.8% of the popular vote, yet returned the, uh, returned the government and continued to be the dominant kind of, the, 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 the dominant party in Japanese politics. So, you know, if you think of all the kind of, you know, hand-wringing and frustration over um, the most recent presidential election here in the United States where uh, President Trump did not receive the popular vote, this is not a regular occurrence in Japan, but it can happen. And the LDP have successfully kind of leveraged the system that they have. In the Cold War, this had a specific context because the LDP certainly reflected, and in large part continue to reflect, goals that are certainly you know, have a consistent endpoint with American goals. It, it, it's, it's, it would be very wrong, it would be incorrect to see the LDP as kind of um, handmaidens to American foreign policy. That's really not true. However, there's definitely key moments, particularly in the 1950s and early 1960s, where the LDP saw the reality of what, um, uh, of the Cold War situation and perceived, you know, an important reality in, in Japanese foreign relations, which was that, you know, partnering with the Americans was vital. Um, what is sometimes called the security umbrella of the Americans, particularly during the Cold War. And some people have criticized, you know, Japanese politicians, particularly the LDP, for perhaps entering into this idea of effectively, you know, more or less, you know, taking on the American military defense uh, or American military protection in order to facilitate other kind of economic changes and social changes and, and so on. Certainly throughout the 1950s, building up to the Security Treaty of 1960, you are seeing um, uh, an awareness among certain elites in Japan who go on to form the LDP of what would benefit American foreign policy. So for example, someone like Kishi Nobusuke uh, becomes Prime Minister in the 1950s to a large extent because he's kind of a good fit with what the Americans would like to happen and what these Japanese elite groups want to kind of drive. This is notable because Kishi had been indicted as a war criminal, in fact, been convicted of being a war criminal. And he represented a very kind of specific type 
of Japanese conservatism. In fact, he's the grandfather of the current Japanese leader, Shinzo Abe, um, and Abe's own reluctance to kind of acknowledge Japanese war guilt and things like this continues to be a massively problematic issue. So going back, you know, to the 1950s, 1960s, you have this complexity of kind of a specific type of Japanese conservatism. So what does political opposition in post-war Japan look like? Well, the LDP kind of dominates the parliament and dominates the organs of power, certainly for the first 20 years after its formation. Uh, going into the 1970s. Um, I talked about enterprise unionism in a previous video, but it's worth pointing out that Japanese union activity was quite, um, could be quite, you know, vibrant and if not assertive or even aggressive going into the 1950s. 56% of Japanese uh, workers are in a union as of 1949. You have the formation of the General Council of Trade Unions of Japan in 1950 and workplace struggle is seen as a viable strategy by Japanese workers. This arguably comes to a head in 1960 with the Mike mine strike, this massive mine, this massive strike at a mine uh, owned by the Mitsui Corporation um, after the Mitsui Corporation had tried to quote unquote rationalize the mines and effect kind of you know uh, encroaching further on what workers rights did exist. The strike goes on for over 300 days, the government employs um, police, uh, you know, it deploys police to try and resolve it. Um, it goes on for, you know, 313 days, almost a year, but ultimately sees the corporation triumphant. So this is kind of an important kind of turning point in the emergence of this kind of enterprise unionism kind of concept that we're talking about. So, you know, I, I bring all this up really just to kind of point out that although one can see a broad kind of shift towards this particular attitude towards unionism, or rather the role of unionism, and the some might see at the compliance of unionism in, in uh, corporate leadership goals, it, it's not that simple. There are definitely Japanese who don't want that, who don't agree with it. There were Japanese who had envisioned a different role for unions in Japanese life. And those people, I, they lose, really. They lose that, that particular argument. Intriguingly, one of the elements that has kind of emerged as a kind of form of post-war cultural opposition in Japan is the peace movement. Now, Article 9 of the Constitution makes it very clear that the Japanese state is not permitted to form a military and is not permitted to wage war. Nevertheless, people like Kishi Nobusuke and others, um, and Shinzo Abe is one of these people, you know, they come from a constituency that is reluctant to acknowledge Japanese war guilt, that is kind of very much kind of like, why are we blamed for everything kind of camp, you know, um, it was just a war and we waged it and we had the right to wage it and now it's over. Um, not surprisingly, these same people would very much like to um, dilute Article 9, and would very much like to create a Japanese military. Now, they have done a lot of this, especially in the last 20 years. The National Defense Force, as it's known, has become really quite formidable and is more impressive than, you know, many militaries across the world. But Japan technically does not have um, a military movement. Um, this has frustrated people, uh, Japanese people, I should say, in the post-war period. The post-war peace movement is very important. And of course, the post-war peace movement, as well as energizing lots of opposition to various government policies, has also found itself, you know, um, in conflict with American presence in Japan. Um, the Americans, uh, for example, hold on to Okinawa until 1973. There are American military bases in Japan, American military service personnel in Japan up until today. Um, you know, only a few years ago, you had about 46,000 active personnel on Japan's main islands and an additional 37,000 on Okinawa. Okinawa has been Japanese territory since 1973, but it's continued to be um, a major kind of outpost of American military uh, personnel. This kind of made more sense um, in the Cold War period um, and today is kind of creating all kinds of, you know, challenging problems in particular when American military personnel will do things that are, you know, unpleasant, maybe getting drunk in public or in some cases criminal, such as assaults um, of local people. These things have happened and they can cause extremely deep friction and problems with the local communities. This isn't something new. Um, the 1960 Security Treaty, uh, which was basically a renewal of, um, of the security arrangement between Japan and the United States that had been established at the end of the occupation period, was very divisive and attracted massive, massive crowds outside Japan's national parliament. In fact, there was divisiveness and shouting and screaming inside the parliament building. And very famously, they have to actually pick up the Speaker of the House and they carry him like a battering ram so that he can reach the gavel and hit it. And this is how they pass through the 1960 Security Treaty. It's extraordinarily um, controversial um, in Japanese society. There are many Japanese people who argue, listen, we're, we're not truly independent. We are, we are subordinate to American interests as long as we're part of that American security umbrella. 
this isn't something that's acceptable. Now, maybe you're sitting there going, well, hang on, there's a group who who are kind of conservative and, and want to build up the Japanese military, and there's a group that want to see Japan remain neutral, but then there's a group that believe that Japan cannot be independent of the United States as long as the Americans are providing military protection. It goes on like this. So which group is in which camp? Well, the answer is it kind of depends on the situation, right? And these constituencies are quite complex and quite complicated. As the 70s and 80s go on in particular, you start to see lots and lots of popular protest. Um, in the 1970s, for example, there's a lot of protests in Japan against the Vietnam War. Now, the Viet Japan was not technically directly involved in the Vietnam War, but as allies of the United States and as a country that provided various kinds of assistance, both logistical and financial to the United States, many Japanese, particularly young Japanese, they're not exclusively young Japanese, felt that Japan was complicit in what was increasingly seen by many in Japan as effectively a criminal enterprise. The American War in Vietnam was not justified. Um, this is also joined by growing environmental concerns in Japanese society. You have the emergence of kind of student activism on Japanese university campuses. The Zengakuren group, which literally means all students, um, is emerging to kind of um, agitate on behalf of what they see as uh, important interests against the government. And as I mentioned, environmental protests become a very big concern. The Narita Airport in Tokyo, or outside Tokyo was an extraordinarily contentious um, construction. And you see, you know, this, this idea of, of um, the demand for environmental justice, um, the demand for government recognition of the environment and government care of the environment is something in Japan that has a very vivid history going back to the 1970s. Now, the backdrop to all of this is that the Japanese, you know, economic miracle is not quite as smooth and easy, um, certainly going through the 1970s, as perhaps my previous lecture might have kind of, you know, implied a little bit. In particular, um, the Nixon shocks, as they're known in Japan, have a huge impact on not just the Japanese economy, but on Japanese kind of cultural um, identity um, and dis discourse. And what are the Nixon shocks? Well, the first one is in 1973 when Nixon goes to visit Chairman Mao uh, in China. This is negotiated by Henry Kissinger, Nixon's close aide, and is considered, you know, historically as a masterstroke by Nixon. You know, Nixon had been very much an anti-communist as a younger politician and had actually kind of, elect, you know, been elected as, you know, a guy to stand up to the communists. By the early 1970s, he's talking about peace with honor, which is basically a way to get the United States out of the war in Vietnam in a way that doesn't shame the United States, in a way that remains vigilant against the encroachment of global communism and so on and so on. But Nixon's advisor Kissinger had noticed something or had figured something out that his predecessors had not and were reluctant to, and in, in their defense I think was would have been challenging to see, which is that the Russians and the Chinese, despite various kind of um, perceptions and, and, and statements of communist brotherhood and everything else, uh, were having very serious problems, that Beijing and Moscow had uh, had very serious disputes, and that this split, as it became known, the Sino-Soviet split, could be, um, could be utilized, could be exploited by the United States. And so Nixon goes to see Mao, and he meets with Mao, and it's this major symbolic moment. And by 1979, the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Republic of China, which is run by the Chinese Communist Party, has been recognized by the United States. Now, why is this a shock for the Japanese? Nixon didn't tell the Japanese. He didn't tell the Japanese he was going to do it. And this was an enormously kind of traumatic thing for the Japanese public. And it was a very upsetting thing for the Japanese government. In particular, for the previous couple of decades, the Japanese government had occasionally looked into um, trading opportunities with the Chinese and had repeatedly been told or asked or, or, or whatever word you want to use by their American um, allies not to do that. And then suddenly Nixon went to China. This was a, a real problem. Secondly, Nixon had removed the US dollar from the gold standards, part of Bretton Woods, um, which at the time was a big deal because it had a huge impact on Japanese exports into the United States. And again, the Japanese weren't consulted. The 1970s as a whole, of course, are known, and, and uh, your grandparents would certainly remember, um, for the oil shortages and the oil shocks that affected um, the wider world. There's a dramatic rise in the price of oil following the Middle East War of 1973. And in Japan, price inflation reaches 25% in 1974, which is a you know very, very scary thing for your average Japanese consumer. You see a run on toilet paper. Sound familiar? In Japanese uh, grocery stores and supermarkets, people are pan panic buying toilet paper um, as prices for everything is going up. And in 1974, the gross national product in Japan declined by 1.4%. It declined. Remember, it had been going up by 10% or an average of 10% at least every year since the 19. 50s. This is astonishing. This is an astonishing kind of turnaround in Japanese fortunes. After the shocks, and we'll come back to this probably for maybe the last video lecture of 
the term, Japan has to kind of adapt. And in particular, in the 1980s, one of the big changes is the rise of multinational corporations. Corporate life in Japan was nothing new, but the rise of multinational corporations brings kind of an added element to kind of Japanese identity. So what was the point of all this? I suppose my goal really is to say that <laughs> Japanese post-war culture is complicated. And that's always a vital thing when we're in a Western classroom, virtual otherwise, talking about an Asian society or any non-Western society, to be mindful and be careful of narrowing down these perspectives and these ideas into these one-dimensional um, experiences. Uh, I say that not to lecture you, pun intended, uh, but it's something that I myself am struggling with all the time. And it's always a huge challenge for historians because you need that narrative, right? You need, you need, you need, you need to get that hook and, and figure out a way to understand it yourself and then put it into a paper and explain your argument to somebody else. In this case, me more directly. But when you're writing, you know, your audience more broadly. So just being vigilant of being one dimensional is important. And even being able to like, as I did in the last 15 minutes, to kind of go through, these are all the different things that are kind of happening simultaneously, which shows us that, you know, it's complex. There's a complexity to Japanese post-war culture. So the discussion question of the video, I'd like you to choose one aspect of Japanese post-war culture as described in this video or in your reading and discuss how that aspect can shape our understanding of Japanese culture from the 1950s through the 1980s. Thanks for watching.